Welcome to the studio. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So uh, we just heard a clip there of Spunkle. Yes. And I, and I mentioned it's your mission to sort of broaden, subvert uh, the one-dimensional, uh, quote-unquote, other characters. Yes. Uh, how does Spunkle do that? Well, part of it is that you have brown characters... Um, South Asian characters who are in a world living a life having problems as anybody else would. But the characters are also a gay couple having trying to get pregnant. Lots of people are trying to get pregnant. And so it's just sort of looking at the angle of pregnancy and family dynamics and family drama, uh, but putting it putting on the, the, the gels of brownness and the gels of queerness without actually always talking about it or telling everybody, hey, everyone, you're going to watch a gay movie. Hey, everybody, you're going to watch a movie about lesbians and, and brown people and South Asians. Instead, it's just, here's, here's a couple having an issue or here's a family. And it's kind of funny how they deal with it. So their otherness, their difference isn't the center, isn't the focus of the... No, it's it's sort of you know it's it's if if any if any straight couple were trying to uh, have a baby and get pregnant in uh, you know uh, in a way that wasn't necessary like I have friends who are trying to do IVF that leads to a lot of drama a lot of problems a lot of issues so it's it's kind of similar to that so so that's your vision how would those roles typically be cast like in your kind of uh, in hey, wait is so the view. the roles that I I I help create or the mm-hmm. roles that that uh, you know the the big networks so, create so yeah the, the the big networks create if they were doing your story how would those roles be cast well i think part of it would be not to cast uh, actors based on the heteronormative male gaze, white male gaze. So a lot of times, you know, it's wonderful to see so many advancements on television and you see there are gay characters, but a lot of times the gay characters are still gay so that straight white men will still be attracted to that gay character. Give us a concrete example so we can picture what you're talking about here. Uh, okay, so, um, you know, when, when or for, you know what, let's take a big movie that did fantastically, uh, did so well uh, internationally, Blue is the Warmest Color. Blue is the Warmest Color was a fantastic movie that was loved by all types of people. At the same time, the, the love scene in that, it was to, to women who have ever been with another woman before, you're watching that thinking, I don't know about that. This seems like a dude was setting this up. Uh, why is she doing that? That's lingering a little too long to be comfortable, actually. So, so it's that kind of thing. Um, and, and I think we see that, you know, the, the long haired, all, you know, except for Orange is the New Black, that show is kind of breaking down some of the stereotypes. But, um, a lot of times women will be cast who, well, they're lesbians, but they have really long hair and they're a certain body type. So they're not scary to majorities. Do you think those stories are still a step forward in a sense or, or are we kind of past that being progress at this point? I mean, that's that feels like a really like existential question almost. Um, I think it's very big picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Cause that because a lot of people think those stories are a step forward. I think point. they can be a step forward, and I think there's stories that are being told that can be done responsibly, and I think there are stories that can be done irresponsibly. So, you know, for example, this is kind of a little bit different, but making a movie like Gods of Egypt and not casting an actor of color and actually just act, casting actors who are all have the language of colonizers. You know, their their accents are all of colonizers. That feels really confusing. Like there's no justification that makes sense for why that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it can be a step forward, but I think what we can do now, we have we have so much opportunity now, whether it's making a video on your cell phone of you or a cat, whatever suits your fancy, uh, you babies and cats. I mean, those are the three things and, and Roombas. Uh, but, but you put those up on the Internet and, and you do have an audience. You do have a, a captive audience or instant gratification and you do a viewership. So, so whether it's just a, a regular person who's not in the industry making something for people to watch or – me or you making something, I think we, we, we can do it and we should do it. And I don't think we should wait for somebody to tell us who we can be. Why here? Well, God, why not? You know what I mean? Like, it smells good. Um, there's mm-hmm. snacks, free Wi-Fi, you can't beat that. And someone's writing everything down, so there's no confusion. Mm. No, he said, she said. Or <laughs> she said, she said. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the convention is he said, she said. Right, but I mean, we're women, so that's why it's she said, yeah, she I said. I don't think anyone actually says she said, she said. Well, I just speak. did, and I'm somebody. Okay, so but ladies, I don't think I ladies. 
I am sensing you have some control issues here. I don't have control issues. <laughs> so th this is a hilarious short film. Um, <laughs> Thank you. What cues, uh, to continue our conversation uh, around this topic, what cues do you think Hollywood can take from a story and from characters like these? Well, I think part of it, so example, the for example, the first session, I mean, that, we never talked about the fact that people were South Asian. They just happened to have names that weren't John or Samantha. And um, there was a couple. They happened to be two women, but it was never about that. And to me, what happens is you look at that and someone, someone who looks at that, the opportunity then is they can see, they get used to seeing those, those people on camera. They get used to seeing those people's stories as regular stories and create re relatability. So I think there's that. I think another thing is I think creators do have a responsibility to, if you have a role that either can be cast actually authentically to do the due diligence and look around and it's going to be hard work. It's not easy to cast authentically. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's going to make you have to make an extra phone call. And, and, and so it's a little harder, but it's worth it. And also there are lots of roles on a show. And I find this a lot lately where you're watching something and I'm like, why are all those characters white? There's nothing that makes them have to be. That's the lens of the creator. And I get that that might be the world they're a part of, but I think if everything is shifting, then, then maybe it's time for them to sort of take a step forward and say, how can I be better? How can I make this reach more people? You know, and people are doing that with their storylines. How do I make this storyline more relatable? Well, how do I make my cast more relatable? Mm -hmm. um, and I think your story can inherently become more relatable if you cast more diversely. Okay. Um, more broadly now, humor runs through everything you do. I, uh, I hate humor. <laughs> I don't find comedy funny. Uh, tell me about the first <laughs> time you realized as a child uh, that you could use humor um, as a tool. Well, uh, I, well I'm Canadian, so uh, I, I, uh, I lived in Nova Scotia for a while, um, for, in Sydney, Nova Scotia, right as there. As a kid? As a kid, yeah, mm -hmm. as a little one. Uh, I was like five through 16 and a half. Not that I counted. Uh, <laughs> about to say, not not wow. that I counted or anything. Uh, but uh, when we moved there, I, you know, it's a very small town. I don't know if you've been to Sydney, but there's not a lot of diversity or wasn't back then. Uh, I was the only non-white kid. I was the only um, non-Christian kid. And so uh, my first day in school, I get there and it's lunchtime and I'm already feeling really awkward and weird and brown. And um, so everybody opens their lunch and, you know, Mine's the stinky lunch. I'm the kid with that lunch, you know? I've got the, like, Pakistani kima sandwich in a roti, you know? Everybody else has these beautifully beige bologna sandwiches. And that, as a kid, that is all you want. So I was really nervous uh, and kind of scared. Um, so then the next day I get back to school. It's lunchtime. And this time when I opened my lunch, instead of feeling really kind of isolated, I have no idea why I did this, but I just kind of jumped up on my desk uh, and started dancing. <laughs> um, and everybody started laughing. And they weren't laughing at me. They were laughing with me and enjoying the moment with me. And that was this moment where I realized, oh, wow, like making someone laugh, that means something. Hmm. And that's kind of followed through as a, as a survival tool in, in some ways. And then as I got older and sort of was able to actually wield it a little bit more um, – with, with intention, um, I found that it's also a way to talk about tough things um, that might otherwise cause a knee-jerk reaction um, and connect in a very, very different way. Oh, I want to get into that, but first this moment, dancing on the table, kindergarten, grade one. Um, this was a sort of a coming out for you as well as a Muslim Pakistani person in the classroom? Yes. Gosh, this coming out never stops. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, I just came out as Canadian. Aren't you all happy? It's so beautiful. I was born in London, Ontario, by the way. You too? I grew up in London, Ontario. Oh, right on. Almost born. Oh, I, I, born. that's we're connected. Yeah, we're deeply, siblings. Deeply. <laughs> um, what, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, no, so this moment, um, <laughs> was this sort of you yeah. coming out to your classmates as a Pakistani Muslim person. Yeah, because there's really not a lot you can do. I mean, when you are the only one, you either, f you have to find a way to survive. And so for me, it was saying, hey, I'm here, I'm weird. 
It's cool. I'm cool with it too. And I actually really believe in the whole phrase, fake it till you make it. It's, it's, I think it can be really empowering. And I think at that point, maybe I was trying to fake it to get there, but then I did. Hmm. Um, you talked about that the coming out never stops. Now, you, initially you worked <laughs> as, a, as a lawyer. Yeah, don't judge me. Um, I won't. I won't judge you here. Uh, safe space. Uh, but you you did work <laughs> as a lawyer. Yes, I did. And then you came out as an actor. And what what did it take for you to realize? Uh, you know, acting is really what you wanted to do. So um, it. I mean, I, I was acting in in high school, but you know, I was raised in a conservative Muslim family where my mom. Uh, you know, once it was time to, to go to college, it was like, okay, enough with your hobby. What are you going to do for the rest of your life? Now be serious. So I uh, majored in English. <laughs> That's serious. Um, and then uh, I went to law school because what else are you going to do with a liberal arts degree but go to law school? <laughs> and it's, it's you know, it's three years. But when I got to law school, um, it was actually my third year of law school that I took a class called trial advocacy. And trial advocacy is essentially uh, where you are competing. You're, you're learning cross-examinations. You're learning direct examinations. And... Um, um, I object. You're learning a lot of that. All the stuff we see in the movies. Exactly. Okay. Opening and closing arguments. It's awesome. But it's the drama. The drama, I realized, that's a lot less like um, lawyering. And it's a lot more like acting. And that is when I told myself and promised myself, no matter what happens with lawyering, no matter what, I'll take the bar exam, but I need to take an acting class. And I did. And I loved it. And it reconnected me to my to my sense of self and my spirit and my comedy space. And um, I, I said, okay. So I realized also, though, that my most marketable skill at that point was being a lawyer after I passed the bar exam. So I started lawyering by day and acting by night. Okay. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, figuring out how do you be an actor? I don't know. So just asking people questions, taking a class or two. Um, taking steps towards that career. Taking those baby steps, yeah. yeah. How did uh, how did humor help you in that time? Because that's, that's kind of a tumultuous time as you're trying to, you know, going from this safe yeah. place of being a lawyer to uh, the, the world of, of, of acting. Well, I have to say that I <laughs> worked in both the best and the worst lawyer environment ever. Um, the kind of work I was doing was pretty intense. Uh, it was uh, insurance defense litigation, so we were defending companies through their insurance companies for small but also catastrophic injuries, which means people who were um, wrongful death and uh, people who were disabled, uh, differently abled. And so it was it was pretty emotional. But also I happened to work at a kind of a spin-off law firm that had some of the funniest comedians and improvisers who were all secretaries there. Some of them include people like T.J. Miller. <laughs> wow. It was just an amazing... And so our survival was you had we would send haikus to each other, and uh, the office time, lunch time was lots of comedy. And, um, and we were just all in this place of, how did we get here? Um, sleeping under desks may have happened. Um, wow. I'm, I'm glad I, I actually just got a little nervous thinking of like a boss partner coming and yelling at me. For it's funny how those nerves this. stay with you even well after <laughs> the experience itself. Yeah. I still gotten... have exam stress dreams. You do? Yeah. Oh gosh. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> um, so, so that's an amazing uh, transition that you made there. Um, of course you had to break to your family that you wanted to become uh, an actor. Uh, how did that go? Uh, terribly. You know, and I think part of it is, you know, and I always, I always tell people, you know, I, I became an actor the hardest way possible on a lawyer's debt. <laughs> so it was, you know, that was hard for me. But then also, you know, my parents said, you spent all this time, all this money. And, you know, the, the, the acting profession, I think also in our culture, it's evolving. Not only are we not used to seeing our people who look like us on, on screen, we also are just coming from a very different culture and our wave of immigration is different. So, mm -hmm. so we are just getting used to being here. I think as a people, and 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 I think that so are so the generations are dealing with what that means as well, uh, and that acting can be a viable opportunity or a job, or that you know being a radio host like that's a real thing. Like mm -hmm. you can have a great career doing that, or playing video games for life. That's something you can make a lot of money doing. I think that's that's something that that um, our parents' generation they're still trying to grapple with. It's it's always funny me explaining this to my immigrant uh, parents as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, after uh, you became an actor, you also came out as a lesbian. You came out uh, to your mom. Man, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm tired thinking about all this coming out. <laughs> this is, we want to get your whole story here. No, I love it. Um, 
tell me about that. How did that go? Uh, whew. uh yeah. Hmm. No, it, it was, uh, it's a lot, you know, and I, well, and I do want to say, I think the phrase coming out is kind of, uh, I, I think it's a very Western term in a lot of ways, because when I think of being a, uh, you know, a, a South Asian a Muslim woman, cisgendered woman, I think, okay, well, growing up in the family I, I was raised in, I didn't do a lot of things. I wasn't allowed to date. I wasn't allowed to, um, you know, eat pork or drink or wear low-cut T-shirts or skirts or things like that. So suddenly I was going to come back to my mom and say, oh, by the way, mom, um, I know I wasn't allowed to date boys, but now I'm having sex with women. So the phrase coming out, to me, it was also like, well, what am I supposed to come out about? So it's 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 also, uh, it, it's the, the meaning of it is very different, I think, for people who kind of have that multiplicity of identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it was, it was a struggle. It, I mean, I ended up <laughs> telling her from an airport floor in um, on GChat. <laughs> wow. Talk about technology changing our conversations. And it was one of those times, I have a one-woman play that I wrote that uh, kind of uh, called Me, My Mom, I was about Mom to say, you, you processed all this, you know, through show. your art, yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I put that scene in there where I was just really sad and dealing with a kind of tough time in my life. And, you know, who's, you want unconditional love sometimes. And that was, I wanted love from my mom at that moment. And uh, it just all kind of came out for lack of a better Mm -hmm. term, or maybe that's the right term. And um, I told her over Gchat. And it was actually really funny in in ways where I I felt like she didn't understand what I was saying. So I had to keep explaining it. Um, But it was tough, you know, for her. It's her line literally to me was, that was a bombshell, <laughs> you know? You could hear the accent through Gchat. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah totally. And, and so she just, she just it, mm. it's hard. And it still continues to be hard. I think, you know, I joke about the process of coming out is, is continually happening, but it is. I think it always is, whether it's with your parent or with um, community or um, an interview or a moment. You meet somebody on a plane and you're like, what do I want to tell, tell them about who I am? Um, or you're at a Donald Trump rally and you think, ooh, do, do I want them to know I'm Muslim? Oh, he's got a really scary sign, but I'm hugging him. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you are constantly negotiating uh, what of your identity you're going to put out there. Yeah, completely. Right. And yeah. and I think and I think we all experience and I think that's actually pretty relatable uh, across gender, across religion, across across race and community because what what are you going to tell somebody today? Um, so so I, I I think that that actually can bring us together if we let it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we only have about uh, 45 seconds left here, but tell me uh, quickly what what has humor given you through all of these uh, experiences? Humor has helped me make sense of it all. And honestly, it, it, I said it before, but I, I think it's a way of surviving. I think the hardest moment in our lives, the hardest moments, if if we can find some sort of humor, we can connect. And, you know, you look at if you've ever been to a funeral, I mean, sometimes people are just laughing. And that's because sometimes that laughter and that storytelling is a way to make sense of it all and process what just happened and what will happen. Amazing. I hope we have you uh, back here another time. Would love to.